providing patients a healthier and more beautiful life. Dr. Greenberg began his medical career in internal medicine at Georgetown University Hospital and later pursued his interest in dermatology with a dermatology research fellowship at the University of Wisconsin and dermatology training at Scott and White of the Texas A&M University Health System. Dr. Greenberg is board certified in both dermatology and internal medicine. He serves as clinical assistant professor at the Depart Department of Internal Medicine at the University of Nevada School of Medicine, where he enjoys teaching residents. Additionally, he has written multiple articles and book chapters on different aspects of dermatology, including laser treatment of scars and striae. Dr. Greenberg has held multiple cosmetic events around Las Vegas, including an event with the Americans Next Top Model and a Fuller Lips for Bigger Tips promotion. Please welcome Dr. Greenberg. Uh, thank you, and thanks for spending your uh, Halloween with, with me. Uh, typically, uh, Halloween in Las Vegas is quite a wild time. You are going to see a lot crazier things out there than you will in here. Although we will have some wild things going on uh, in the lecture. Um, and without further ado, we'll, we'll get uh, moving on. The uh, disclosures, I don't have any disclosures relevant to this lecture. I do speak for a number of different uh, pharmaceutical companies and laser manufacturer uh, signature, but uh, for today's lecture, there's no conflicts of interest. Uh, today, uh, talking about botulinum toxins, as of now, there are two botulinum toxins. There was a third, zeomin, which will come into effect at some point. Uh, there was uh, a, an issue with them coming to market. They will be coming to market at some other point in the future. Uh, but we're going to be talking about Botox and Dysport. And there are some unique to Nevada issues with those injectables that I'll be talking about as well uh, when we get to them. Um, botulinum toxins are used to uh, block acetylcholine release, and by blocking the release of acetylcholine, uh, they make it so that uh, muscles aren't able to move, which is excellent because these smooth hyperfunctioning lines, uh, it changes the facial uh, contours, can be used in multiple areas, and because of the mechanism of action and because of the acetylcholine release, can be used for uh, disorders such as hyperhidrosis. Uh, it also has an indication for headache, Botox does. So there's a lot of different uh, things that, that botulinum toxins are used for, including, and we don't do it in dermatology, but people who have bladder issues are now getting injections, people who have vocal cord issues. There are many uses of botulinum toxin. Yes, it is botulism, uh, but it is um, in a uh, level that isn't going to be uh, killing anybody. The effects uh, may last longer with subsequent injections. Uh, you could have possible side effects where you can uh, have diffusion into non-targeted muscles, and when we talk about diffusion, that will be part of the issue uh, with how you decide to dilute your toxin. The toxin comes as a powder uh, and has to be diluted. You can't inject a powder. Um, if you don't inject properly uh, and you miss the proper muscles, you can have different and uh, unwanted side effects. The best part about the drug is that four to six months later, it's gone. So even if you did the worst job ever, it's going to disappear and people are going to look fine. Seven types of botulinum toxin. Uh, botulinum toxin type, type A is what we're using with Dysport and with Botox. That's able botulinum toxin for Dysport and onobotulinum toxin for uh, Botox. Uh, they work by chemodenervation. Uh, the presynaptic release of acetylcholine is how it's affected. I don't know if on your uh, exams, if this is part of uh, any kind of examination that you take, but th these are key points um, in academics. In the real world, it really doesn't make much difference, except that if you have somebody who has a nerve disorder, you need to know you're not going to be injecting them with botulinum toxin. So that should be on your uh, paperwork. Uh, these are the, the type A toxins. Um, myoblock is a, is a type B, um, and that's working on the synapt synaptobrevin receptor, so it's a little bit different. This SNAP25 light chain is the key for uh, examination. That's where um, the effects take place. But again, in the real world, it, it doesn't matter to you. Uh, the mechanism of action, uh, denervation, they, they base the units uh, on what would be the lethal dose for 50% of mice that get the drug. Uh, for a human, 
It requires 2,500 to 3,000 times the amount that would require for a mouse for that lethal dose. So 40 units per kilogram would be the lethal dose. Now, each bottle of botulinum toxin, so each bottle of Botox has 100 units if you're using the standard bottle, or 50 if you're in Nevada and doing half bottles for people. So uh, half a bottle of Botox, 50 units of Botox, is not anywhere near a uh, lethal dose. That'd be for, if somebody weighed one kilogram, uh, that'd be the lethal dose. So uh, there's really not much to worry about. As I said, they come as a powder. Uh, I think Nevada is the only state in the union where, where people are using the 50 unit bottles. A lot of times people are taking these uh, you know, 100 unit bottles and dividing them up among multiple people. And we'll get into this in a minute, why we can't do that here. Uh, there are different ways to draw up the toxin. I use preserved saline, the sodium uh, bicarbonate in that preserved saline offers some sort of anesthetic effect for people. That, that is uh, appreciated. Uh, concentration, the concentration of the uh, botulinum toxin is really for the injector. And it becomes a huge math problem. Uh, you need to keep straight in your mind, how are you diluting your toxin? And you need to do it the same way every single time. Because if you don't, you're just gonna drive yourself nuts and it just takes too much time and it's too difficult to figure out. Uh, the Carruthers, uh, who uh, there's uh, he and she Carruthers, uh, they both are in Vancouver. And when they uh, recommended their drawing up of toxin, they used one uh, ml of toxin for each 100 units. And it's a very simple formula if you do it that way. That's personally the way that I do it. There, you can do it any way. Just do it the same way every time. Um, there is no equivalent for Dysport and Botox. They're different products, they're different companies, and they didn't do comparative studies on how, to, on, on how they relate to one another. I use a three to one ratio personally for the way that I do Dysport and Botox, and I will put, um, each bottle of Dysport is 300 units. I will use one ml of uh, saline in that 300 units of Dysport, so each one, uh, each 0.1 mLs, each 0.01 mLs is equal to uh, three units of Dysport or one unit of Botox. And that's how I do it. And in my charting and everything that I do, I say, please note, if Dysport is being used, three units is equivalent to one unit of Botox. I keep everything in Botox units because when I was trained, Dysport didn't exist. And I know what the Botox units are supposed to be. I multiply it by three, and that's what I put as my Dysport units but I always put everything in Botox units. Same way every time, uh, just so I stay out of trouble. Um, so this is what I was saying, you gotta get your head screwed on straight and know what you're doing. If you do one cc, it's 10 units per 0.1 ml and, and on down. Now, when I'm injecting Axilla, uh, I, because of the bottle size, do five, do five cc's in the Botox bottle, and because of the bottle size, I do four cc's in the Dysport bottle. It's a smaller bottle, and you can't put five cc's in the Dysport 300 unit bottle. It doesn't, it's impossible. So uh, the, the, you only have so much product when you're gonna be injecting the axilla. And I'm using the one ml syringes when I do axillary injections. So for that, uh, you just look at it and you say, well, I put four, four cc's in, I pulled out four syringes. This is what I have. This is the one cc no waste syringe that we use in my clinic. You can't just eyeball this, all right? You're talking about a $600, syringe, uh, a $600 bottle of toxin that you're selling to a person. So you can't just look at it and say, um, well, I think you know, I'm gonna take a three cc syringe and I'm gonna draw up one cc in that three cc syringe and then I'm gonna draw off units. No, you have to be super precise. That's why you want a no waste syringe, one cc, inject it in there and then draw up with um, this uh, diabetic no waste syringe needle. There's no hub. Um, for me, every hash mark is equivalent to one unit of Botox because I do one to 0 0.01, if that makes sense. Any, any questions about this part of it? Again, this is purely for the provider. You can draw it up however you want, but you have to know what you're, 
what the numbers are or you're not going to do it right. Once you get this done, everything else is easy. The math problem's over, you know how much product you have and you just pick this five units here, 10 units here, whatever. Um, so in Nevada, they, we, we had a case where a doctor gave hepatitis to a bunch of patients using propofol and the propofol said single patient use on it. Uh, and he was using multiple, um, he was using the same needle with uh, multiple people getting that, that propofol. Uh, we're not doing that with Botox, you're gonna drop a fresh needle for every person. That said, if you look on the bottle itself, it says for single patient use on it. And that doesn't mean let's be cute, no, I'm gonna draw up you know, all these syringes, and I'm gonna inject all these syringes to multiple people, really it was just single patient use. Uh, you can lose your medical license in the state of Nevada if you do that. So anything that says single use, just single use. This is the only state in the union where it's like this. I had medical licenses in five states because of all of the different places that I train. And no other place I've ever been have I heard of this. But it is what it is. Um, so, we're gonna only be injecting uh, six people today because we have six bottles of Dysport and whatever we don't use, we're gonna throw away. Uh, Botox takes about one to two weeks for the effects to take place. And you're gonna want to warn your patients, look, I'm injecting you today, but it'll be one to two weeks before you see the effects because people will call up, you did it, I don't see any results, this is terrible, you know, what did you sell me? Definitely manage your expectations by telling them when product is going to be working. Disport, I find, uh, tends to have a mechanism of action that comes about more quickly. So after a few days, uh, they're just going to say, wow, it, it really worked. Um, the effects, uh, they're obvious for the first three to four months. They can last four to six months. Different people are different. Uh, we now have reminders for people that we send out at three to four months in hey, you know, would you like to schedule your next appointment for injectable? Um, if somebody has a nerve disorder, multiple sclerosis, myasthenia gravis, history of Bell's palsy, then you're not gonna want to be injecting them. Um, I don't have a good reason for that, except you may exacerbate their nerve disorder, and these are the recommendations. I've never done it for somebody who has th those disorders. Do I really, in my heart of heart, think that it's gonna cause a problem? Probably not, the same way as injecting a pregnant woman or somebody who's lactating. I don't think it's gonna cause a problem there either, but I don't want them to point to their miscarriage and say that I was the cause. So I don't inject pregnant women and I don't inject lactating women. Uh, if there's an active infection, don't inject there. Uh, relative contraindications, people who are on aminoglycosides, it may increase the effect, so that may be a good thing. Um, and then penicillamine, quinine, or calcium channel blockers, uh, you just need to be a little bit more aware. Uh, different techniques, uh, ideally for muscles of, muscles of facial expression, you're going to be injecting into the muscle itself. Uh, you can inject subcutaneously depending on, you know, are you doing for axillary hyperhidrosis because there's no muscle there. Uh, that's the spot. Um, and then the crullers do intradermally. You can chill the area with ice. These needles are so small, I always tell my patients, these are diabetic needles. They're very tiny and it really shouldn't hurt and it may just be uncomfortable. And when you use the preservative uh, saline, there may be some numbing effect anyway. And then, uh, again, some people like ice. Some people will insist that you put a topical numbing cream on, and that's fine. In my clinic, we charge an extra $10 to do it, basically because they're, they're sitting there in my clinic for an extra 40 minutes. That said, you can write for the, for the medication, have them put it on at home, and then come in. Uh, and education is key. You're gonna want to educate your patients about what they're going to be expecting with the injections. You want to manage expectations and you want to take pictures so that you have a before uh, photo showing them, you know, you were already a little bit asymmetric here before we even start uh, doing anything. You're asymmetric, your smile is a little bit off, although you shouldn't be injecting, uh, you shouldn't be injecting the uh, zygomaticus major and minor because you will drop the smile, but you can inject periorally um, for those fine smoker's lines. Just know that you may make somebody have a little bit of difficulty playing a wind instrument uh, or drinking through a straw. Uh, you could have trouble phonating. Most common area and the only place that it's FDA approved for facial muscles 
is uh, the corrugators, uh, the glomerular complex. Uh, these muscles, obicularis and corrugators, move the brow medially. Uh, Proceris pulls the brow down as the, does the depressor supercilli. And the goal here is to produce a weakening effect. So great picture here of the corrugators and Proceris. And you can see I've asked her to, you know, to bring those corrugators together, to bring that, um, the complex together here. She can't do it, but she has uh, brought her bunny lines into effect because she's really straining there and trying to bring them in, and those are the only muscles that are moving. I did not inject those. Um, it's different for everybody, and in terms of the number of units, uh, for the average female 25 and the average male 35, I think 35 may be a little bit high for the average male in terms of the number of units. But uh, typically what I will do is, uh, here at the, the tail of the corrugator, typically four or five units um, in the, the, the head, uh, near the head of the brow. And we're just about um, a quarter of a centimeter uh, above that brow. Uh, I'll inject uh, six units. And again, these are all expressing units of Botox. Three times that would be disport units. I can't keep it straight. Um, and then I would do seven or eight in, in, uh, in Proceris. And that's the way that I do it. I do the same on this side as I do on the other side. Uh, these are not my photos, but these are pretty standard uh, results of somebody who would have gotten corrugators injected. Has anybody here not injected corrugators? OK. Um, you want to, when, when you go in, uh, you just go in uh, till you bury the, um, I always go bevel up. People asked about that the other lecture. I go bevel up. You want to bury the bevel so that you're in the meat of the muscle. And you don't want to go too far down, but you want to be in the meat. And then you, you uh, drop product. Crow's feet. Uh, so these contract obicul uh, obicularis oculi. The obicularis is a sphincter. Um, and it just uh, shrinks down. And the goal is just weakening in the lateral side. You can get a raising of the brow when you do that, which, which can be nice. And uh, 12 units on, on either side is typically what I will do. And I'll space them out um, in a manner that I'll show you in the next picture. You want to avoid the veins. I wear lenses when I inject. Doesn't mean that I don't get bruising, because there are small venules that you're going to hit. And making sure that you warn somebody beforehand is informed consent, and if you tell them afterward, well, that's a complication. So tell everybody, we may bruise you with this injection. We may drop your brow with this injection. Um, here, uh, I would inject right here at the tail of the brow. Three units, three units, three units, three units. If you drop it down here, you may get into trouble, because zygomaticus uh, major and zygomaticus minor come in, and you can drop the smile. So uh, you don't want to hit that. And you want to make sure that you're superficial. Because even if you do inject low and you are superficial, you may be OK. You inject deep, you're going to hit the deeper muscles, you're going to affect the smile, and you're going to be hated. Uh, frontalis, uh, I enjoy injecting this, uh, this muscle. This is what's going to elevate the brow. Um, it's going to soften the forehead lines. But you may get some brow ptosis, because depending on where you inject, you may lower the brow. And I'll show you in the next slide areas to avoid uh, with injection. Um, they say that you should always do the brow depressors at the same time. I don't necessarily agree with that. Um, usually, I'll do 10 units on either side. And this is a classic. If you look at this before and this after, where she's trying to raise her brow, you can see that even you, at rest here, you can see these, these lines, even at rest. And they're just softened here in motion, which is pretty cool. And you, having pictures like this to show somebody is just so helpful. Uh, so definitely take your pictures. I would never inject at this line or below, because you could drop the brow. Um, uh, uh, does anybody inject there? If you do, um, maybe do half as much as you would ever do there and warn them that you could drop their brow. But this is pretty standard. This is the Sharpay look. And we get a couple of people who are like dormant at the nightclubs here who don't like it. And we inject those guys uh, typically with like 40 units 
um, in this area, and then we have to figure out where to put the rest of it. But some people just have hyperdynamic muscles, and when you have really strong muscles, you're going to need more product. That's just the nature of it. Uh, this is a really neat little area to inject this, uh, you know, hypertrophic obicularis. Inject right there. I, I do one to two units, mid pupillary line, right below the eyelid, and that will soften uh, this, uh, this little jelly roll. And uh, it's a pretarsal obicularis. You can do a snap test prior. Uh, the reason you would do that is you want to make sure that they have some, um, that, that it's moving. Uh, that they have some rebound in their, and turgor in their skin. If they don't, <laughs> it's just going to be lax and they're going to get dry eyes. And that could be a problem. Um, depressor ang anguli oris, the lip depressors. Um, right here is where that depressor is. Injecting just a couple units may help lift that. Because this is a depressor muscle, depressors will pull down. When you uh, inhibit that ability, they'll lift it up, an upturned smile. You can get an asymmetric smile if you overdo it here. So you're going to want to be careful, uh, have them bite down and feel for it, and then just go right into where that muscle is. And again, you're not going to hit zygomaticus major in those areas. It's just not, it doesn't exist there. Gummy smile, I took this, I ripped this slide off of the internet. This is not my patient, um, but I wanted to give credit. Uh, injecting two units right there, deep, will lower uh, the um, levator labi, and we'll get rid of the, the, the gummy smile. I've never done this. Uh, I'd be willing if I had the right person to do it, but with the warning that I could give them an asymmetric smile. Uh, dimpled chin, I've done a number of these. People don't like their dimpled chin. Do uh, four units on either side here, and, and, and that would be fine. You want to just stay right in the meat of, uh, of mentalis for that. Platysmal bands, we'll be doing some injection of platysmal bands today. It's a really cool uh, procedure to do. However, uh, you may make it difficult for somebody to turn their head and they may have difficulty swallowing. So you don't want to overdo it. There can always be a complication uh, with any procedure. Uh, the way that I do it is probably uh, 15 to 20 units per band. And I'll just inject one, two, three, four, and five spots, uh, dividing it out so that it comes out to be 20 units. You know, so four units in each area. I pinch the, put the, the band and just inject in between uh, my fingers when I do that. Has anybody injected bands before? Yeah. Uh, it's, it's a nice procedure, and this does look great um, when, when it works. Um, no expression, too much toxin. <laughs> Masseter injection. This can be a really wonderful uh, and face-changing procedure to do to someone. People who have TMJ are sometimes now being injected with um, botulinum toxin, 25 to 50 units. I've done 25 units on, on each um, masseter, and you have them bite down so you can feel the muscle. You mark the three areas that you're going to inject with a marking pen, and then you just divide up those, those uh, 20 units, you know, uh, six, seven, and six, or whatever you're going to do into the areas. But you can see, I, I didn't really recognize until she pointed it out, just this hypertrophic masseter. And this is just at rest. And this was after you know, in injection. So uh, this was in October, and this is in November. And she was really happy with it. It really smoothed out her face. A lot of Korean uh, people have more full, rounded faces. And they have hypertrophic masseters. And that's very common in that culture to get those injected. Yes? It's the same. It'd take about a week or two. Uh, you can warn somebody that they may uh, have, um, you know, some difficulty chewing, and they could collect in their pockets of their of their mouth some uh, some food particles. And they have to put their finger in to get it out. But their face will look good. <laughs> um, actually, hyperhidrosis. Like I said. Uh, Four, uh, four cc's for the Dysport bottle because it's smaller, five cc's for the Botox bottle. It is not indicated for Dysport. It's only indicated for Botox. So 
you can let the patient know this is not indicated for this product, but we're going to use it anyway. And, and uh, you know, that's your discretion. Um, some people will do a starch iodine test. When I first started my, my practice, uh, well, when I was in residency, I, that's what I did. We you know, put the starch on and, and we stained them and saw where the sweating was. Now I just go where I see the axillary hair and I just inject wherever the hair is. Um, but it just seems easier to me. I used to mark it um, with a pen and now I don't mark it. I just you know, figure what looks that way and I see where the little uh, blood mark is and I just go a centimeter below that and just space them a centimeter apart. Because you're using a dilution of four or five cc's, there will be spread. Uh, when you use a concentration of one cc, there's less spread. Uh, it's a more concentrated injection. Uh, you can control where the product is going better with a one cc dilutant. And that's why for the face, I really like to be in control and know that where I lay the product is where it's gonna end up staying. We had, I spoke earlier at my uh, filler lecture uh, that I enjoy injecting fillers first and toxins second. And the reason for that would be that if you inject the toxin first and then you inject the filler right after, you may push some of that toxin and spread it to areas that you don't want it to be in. So I would always go that route. I've never done it the other way. I've never, yes I have. I have done pulmonary planter injections. The key there is to do nerve blocks. I did it without doing a nerve block and I swear I'll never do that again. We iced the hands, we injected, we iced the hands. It was horribly painful for the patient and probably worse for me because I felt so bad. So um, there you can do 50 to 100 units uh, per, per palm. Uh, they're very worthwhile and important injections to do, but you have to have the stomach for it or you have to do the nerve blocks for it. Uh, there are options. So um, a thoracic sympathectomy would be an option for somebody who has this kind of sweating. The problem is you can get a condition called compensatory hyperhidrosis. So you may stop sweating on your hands, but now you're going to be sweating on your face. Um, additional areas, we talked a little bit about the lips. Um, I've never injected marionette lines. I have injected bunny lines. I enjoy doing that. For nasal flare, um, where people who flare on their nose, you can inject it there as well. The gummy smile, never done. The neck, yes. And then areas of asymmetry. There are some people who are injecting Botox now when they do surgery uh, so that there's less movement in the area of surgery and may make it so the scar doesn't spread. Um, complications, ptosis of the eyelid. Um, so you're going to want to check uh, if there's uh, some laxity there, the snap test. Um, dry eyes. Uh, it says reactivation of HSV. That would be really more for um, somebody who has uh, filler injection. Uh, even if you're injecting around the mouth with, uh, with botulinum toxin, I wouldn't be as concerned, although if I did, I would ask if they have a history of HSV. Um, people may make antibodies to the toxin, and if they do that, then, and they wonder, well, why didn't it work? You injected me, we've done it for five years, why isn't it working now? Well, they may have antibodies. I'm not exactly sure how you test for that. But um, if they do, then you're not gonna be, the product just isn't gonna work for them anymore. Uh, I've never seen systemic side effects. They could get jittery, potentiate uh, neurologic disease, flu-like symptoms, skin eruptions. I have seen people who said, you know, I now have headaches since you've injected me with Botox. It is used to treat headaches. So for those people, I, I don't really know what to say except it's a known complication of, or known adverse event of the product and it's also used to treat that, that disorder. So uh, sometimes you just can't win. Uh, if you do get lidtosis, there is a drug called iopidine and it is an alpha adrenergic and it works on these Muller's muscles, which are the superior tarsal muscles that you can't see, but they're deep inside the, the lid. And those can lift up the lid when you put the eye drops in. So there are ways to get out of it. Just make sure that you talk to the, the patient and find out what their concerns are and what's happening with them. Um, that's it for that part of it, but I'm happy to answer questions on this.